All right, so today we're going to talk about inflection points. And an inflection point is just where a function changes concavity. Okay, and if you recall, the way we determine concavity is by the second derivative. So if the second derivative is positive, then it's concave up at that point. If the second derivative is negative at a point, then it's concave down at that point. Okay, and so you can see here, there's an example of a an uh, increasing function, so this function on the left is an increasing function, and it's changing from concave up to concave down. Okay, so down here the first, second derivative is greater than zero. Up here the second derivative is less than zero, and at the inflection point right here the derivative is zero. Okay, and then here's another example. This is a decreasing function on, on the right hand side here. Um, and it's going from concave down to concave up. And the place where it changes concavity is where the second derivative is zero. So um, if we have a function and we're trying to find the inflection points, that's what we do. We look at the second derivative and um, try to figure out where it's equal to zero. Okay. Now not every point where the second derivative is zero uh, not every point, one of those points is is a um, an inflection point, but that gives us our candidates. And then, in order to determine whether that point is an inflection point, we need to check on either side of the point to and look at the concavity to see that it does indeed um, change concavity at that point. Okay, so we'll look at it, some examples here. Um, so let's just look at this first example. This is actually the problem. Um, the same problem <laughs> we did in 10.1, this is the same function anyway. Um, this function, um, we looked at the critical points and now we're going to look at um, the concavities. So, um, so we're trying to find the inflection points of this function. So we need to find the second derivative, which of course means we had to find the first derivative. Now we found this in the last lecture, but it's easy enough to um, take the derivative of this since it's just a polynomial and we can use the power rule. So we get 3x squared minus 18x uh, minus 48. That's the first derivative. Now again, like to find, to, to find the inflection points, we need the second derivative. So we're going to take the derivative of the derivative. So the second derivative of this function is going to be 6x minus 18. Okay. Now to find the candidates, for inflection points, we set this equal to zero and find out what those x values are. So you can see there's a, this function has a possible inflection point. So I'll write that down, possible, possible inflection point. Oops, point, oh my gosh, point. I, uh, um, at uh, x equals 3, right? Because if I put 3 into this equation, I um, the second derivative is 0. But we don't know that for sure until we test it. So we need to test it. And what we're going to do is just test, um, test points on either side. So let me write that down. Test. We're just going to test points on either side. Um, of x equal 3, the candidate. So this is our candidate. So I'm just going to test some points on either side. So we've got the second derivative. So we can look at the concavity at a point to the left of 3. So let's look at um, f of 0. That's always easy to, to do. That's to the left of 3. Um, if we put 0 into the second derivative, we get negative 18. Okay. So that means it's concave down. Okay, and then we can test the point to the right of 3. So let's just do f of 4. If I plug 4 into the second derivative, I get 20, 24 um, minus 18, which is 6. And that's, of course, greater than 0, so that's concave up. Concave up. All right, so we do indeed have a concavity change at x equals 3. So we can say that um, 
uh, x equals 3 is an inflection point. Now, if we want to, we can evaluate um, we can evaluate the value of the function at f of 3 and get an actual coordinate pair. But um, for most, most purposes, it's fine just to list the inflection point by its x-coordinate. And if we need the y-coordinate, well, we can figure that out. So, all right, let's take a look at another example. All right, so this example says sketch a graph um, of a function. <laughs> should say of, of a function with the, policy, uh, with the following properties. All right, so a lot of times I like to draw, a, you know, just sort of a number line. And this can actually be my x-axis for my sketch of the graph. Um, but I kind of like to record the information that they're giving me. So I'll just start with a number line here. So we'll just, um, just start with this, this line. And it says we have critical points at 4. Actually, why don't I just draw the y-axis too? Okay, so this is going to be f of x, and this is x, okay, and uh, we have we have critical points at 4 and 8, so 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, okay, and then we can keep going from there, but, okay, so we have critical points at 4 and 8, and it's telling me that the, um, the de first derivative is negative, to the left of 4. So that says to th that's telling me that the, to the left of 4, the function itself is decreasing, right? Because the slope, which is the first derivative, is negative. Okay, so we have a, we have a decreasing function to the left of 4. And then, um, and it's positive to the right of 4. Okay, so I think we have to assume that it's positive, you know, for all values to the right of 4. Because it doesn't really, I don't think it's going to, it doesn't tell us any information, so we have to sh assume that all the values to the right of 4 are, uh, it's increasing. Okay, and then we have some inf information about um, the second derivative. And it's telling us that the second derivative is positive to the left of of 8, okay, so to the left of 8, it's concave up, which you can kind of see from, you can kind of tell here, we've got an increasing function, and it's going to be concave up, right, or we have a decreasing to the left of 4 and increasing to the right of 4, so our concave up function is going to have a curve sort of like this, right, it's going to be concave up and decreasing, and then concave up and increasing around 4. Okay. And then um, I'm also going to assume that, you know, like I said before, that all the values to the right of 4 are increasing. But then it's telling us that the um, second derivative is negative to the right of 4. Okay, so that means it's, it's concave down, which means it's concave down and increasing, which means it's actually a curve like this. It's like the left-hand side of a U, right? Because concave down is like a, it's like a upside down U, like an N, <laughs> and it's just the right-hand side of it. So, um, so our concavity, if we, can, if we want to capture both the concavity and the fact that it's increasing, we can draw this kind of curve like this, okay? Okay, so that's, we have all the information. So what that's telling us, this critical point, we, we're told that there's a critical point at 4, so that means the derivative is 0. So we have a local minimum at 4. Now we don't have any information about the values of the function at 4, so I'm just going to pick a point. I'm just going to say, okay, let's say that's our value. Then it's concave up to the right of 8, so it's going to be concave up and decreasing until we get to 4 and then it's concave up and increasing all the way to 8. So let me kind of draw where 8 is. Now again, I don't have any information about any of the, the values of this function. Let's see it's there, okay? So it's concave up and increasing until you get to 8. And then we have an inflection point, right? Because we changed concavity. We went from um, uh, a positive second derivative to a negative. So we went from concave up to concave down. 
Okay, so to the right of 8 is concave down, but it's still increasing, so it's going to be something like that. Okay, so that's sort of a sketch of what this function might look like. Something like that. Okay, so it gives us a general shape of the function, although we don't really know anything about what the actual values are, so we can't draw it very accurately. All right, so that's all we can really do on that problem. So um, again, we have a local minimum here, or yeah, local minimum. Let's write that in here, and then we have this inflection point. Okay, so let's take a look at the next example. All right, so in this example, the graph below shows a population growing toward a limiting population L. Um, there is an inflection point on the graph at the point where the population reaches L over 2. Um, what is the significance of the inflection point to the population? Okay, so let's think about what this means. All right, so I'm just going to drop a little, uh, little dotted line here. I'm going to call this point T1 just because there's this inflection point right here, and um, I'm going to refer to the graph in terms of to the right or to the left of T1. So what this is telling us, let's see, right here where it says um, we have this inflection point. Now obviously this is concave down, up here is concave down, okay, and here it's concave up. So let's think about what that means. When something is concave up, that means that the slope is increasing, right? Um, so as time goes on, in this portion before t time t1, the population is growing faster as time goes on, okay? So it starts out with some at some value, and the slope is getting steeper right, because it's increasing, right, so the slope is getting steeper. So what this tells us is essentially that um, before the time um, t1, um, the population, population is growing and it's growing faster as time goes on. So obviously it's an increasing, it's an increasing function all the way along, but um, the, the actual rate of the population growth is increasing as time goes on, okay? Now to the left, or sorry, to the right of T1, so that means after, after uh, time t1, it's concave down. Oops, I left my n off. Which means concave down says so the second derivative is negative, which means that the slope is decreasing, right? So it's still an increasing function, but the slope itself is decreasing, right? So um, so after time t one, the population is growing, but it's growing um, more slowly, okay? It's growing slower as time goes on. Okay? So the rate of change is becoming less and less. <laughs> okay, now um, the other thing that's interesting to note is that, you know, if, if you get something that's, you got this, this um, slope is increasing, the slope represents the rate of change of the population, then the greatest rate of change occurs right here at the, at the, uh, at the critical point, right? Because it's growing faster and faster, but then it starts slowing down after the critical point. So um, we can also say that the population 
um, is growing the fastest at T1 is growing fastest at T1. All right. So um, now, I like I said before, not every every point where the second derivative is zero is an inflection point. We have to test it. Okay. So um, on these problems, um, you can't just find where the derivative, the second derivative is zero um, and say, okay, that must be by an inflection point because no, you have to test it. You have to actually test it, which means putting values into the second derivative and checking to see whether the concavity is changing on either side of the, of that candidate. So this only tells you a candidate for an inflection point. Candidate. Candidate for an inflection point, and you actually have to test it. So, and as an example, let's look at this one where we have f of x equals x to the fourth. So if we take the first derivative, we get 4x cubed, and we take the second derivative, and we get um, 12x squared, okay? Now, if I set that equal to zero, that's telling me, you know, that an x value of zero is a candidate. Candidate um, for an inflection point. But we don't know. We have to test. Okay, so let's look at some points on either side of x equals zero and see whether the the um, concavity changes. So if we look at, um, let's say we look at negative one. Okay, so that's to the left of zero. If I put negative one into 12x squared, I get 12 times negative one times negative one, which is positive one, so that I get 12. So it's greater than zero which tells me that it's concave, concave up, okay? And if I um, look at the second derivative for positive one, which is to the right of zero, I can take 12 times one squared, which again is 12, which is greater than zero, and it's still concave up, okay? So this, even though the second derivative is zero, um, this is not an inflection point. Okay, so if you were to graph um, x to the fourth, you would see you have this thing that looks like a u, but it's pretty flat across the bottom. I don't know if I'm going to be able to draw this very nicely. <laughs> it looks like a u, but it's, it's, it's not quite a parabola because it's much more flat across the bottom. Okay, and it's concave up all the way. All right, except for maybe at zero itself. All right, so let's take a look at another problem here. All right, so here's another um, another sort of conceptual problem. Um, so we're looking at a, a vase with water in it, and it says the water is being poured at a constant rate. So we're going to assume that the volume that's entering the um, vase is entering at a constant rate of volume, okay, so over time, okay, so in like, in like uh, milliliters per second or something like that, so it's a constant rate, and it's asking us to graph, um, graph the depth of the water with respect to time, and explain the concavity, um, and indicate the inflection points. All right, so let's take a look at this face. Now, if you look at down here, if we look at a, a, like a little cross section of this vase down here at the bottom, let's say we take like a centimeter slice, you can see that there's gonna be a lot more water in that little slice of the volume of the water then up here, if I would take another one centimeter slice of the water, you can see because the diameter of the base is smaller, the volume of the water in that slice is less. Okay, and if the, vo if the water is coming, um, coming in at a constant rate of you know, volume per time, 
then it's going to end up filling faster when the water is at the levels um, at you know this level than at this level. So it's going to start filling. The depth is going to increase. It's going to be constantly increasing, but it's going to increase faster and faster until we get to the halfway point. I'm going to call this the halfway point. Halfway. Right? Because that's where the, the vase is the narrowest. And then it starts widening out again. So then the depth is going to increase slower. Okay, so um, I'm going to pause the video here, write down this stuff so you don't have to watch me write, and then I'll draw the graph with you. Okay, so I've written all these words out for you, but but again, it it just it takes more volume to fill the um, to fill the first centimeter of the vase than it does the fifth centimeter. So if this is like if this is like the first centimeter of the vase, and then this is like the fifth centimeter of the vase. Obviously, it's gonna um, it takes more water to fill that, so it's gonna take more time to fill that first centimeter than the than the fifth centimeter until you get to the halfway point, and then after that, it's going to um, it's gonna take uh, so the, it the depth is gonna increase more slowly. Okay, so the the depth is gonna increase quicker and quicker uh, until you get to the halfway point, and then it's gonna slow down again. So let's let's graph what that looks like. So it's going to start out at some rate, but that rate is going to increase. Okay, so the slope is going to start out at something, but then the slope goes is going to increase, right? So it's going to be concave up. Right? I don't know if I maybe make that a little different so it doesn't look quite so straight up and down. So let's do this like like that. Okay, so it's concave up, so it increases at a at a at a, some rate to begin with, but then that rate increases until we get to the halfway point. So this is let's say the halfway point. Okay, and um, and then it's going to increase more slowly. Okay, so it's gonna increase, but it's gonna the, the the rate of increase is going to slow down because the base is getting wider, so it takes more volume as the to increase the depth as the diameter of the vase increases. Okay, so we have something that looks like this: concave up down here and concave down. But the whole function is continuously increasing. So this is concave down. Um, down here it's concave up, concave up, and this point right at the halfway point is the inflection point. Okay, where the rate of the increase goes from increasing to decreasing. Okay, so the function itself isn't decreasing, the rate that it's increasing <laughs> is decreasing. Okay, it gets, a little, it gets a little confusing sometimes. You got functions and they got the derivatives and they got the derivative of the derivative. You got the you got the function, you've got the rate, and you've got the rate of the rate. So the second derivative is the rate of the rate. Alrighty, I don't know why. I... Okay, so let's take a look at the next example. And um, yeah, I think there's just two more examples. And I didn't put any practice problems in this section just because I've got an exit ticket for you that's probably going to take more time. All right, so let's take a look at this, this example. What is the concavity of this, the graph of this function? Now, obviously, it's a quadratic, right? But we've got ax squared plus bx plus c. We got a bunch of these coefficients that are unknown. But, you know, we can still take the first derivative of it. If we want to look at the concavity, we need the second derivative. So let's take the first derivative first. So it's just going to be 2ax plus b. That's the first derivative. The second derivative, then, here is assuming that a and b are constant. So the second derivative is just 2a, right? Because the derivative of b, just a constant, uh, is just zero. Okay, so the second derivative is 2a, it's a constant. Okay, and so we can, 
if, the, if we're ask if it's asking what the concavity is, then we want to know what what's the sine of two a, and of course the sine of two a is going to de going to depend on the sine of a, so um, we can say that the 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 function is concave up when a is greater than zero. The function is concave up uh, when a what was it? a is greater than zero. Okay, so if a is greater than zero, you know it's just a parabola and it's facing upward. So depending on what a, b, and c are, you know that's just kind of a this is just kind of a generic parabola, but we don't really know where it is here, or how wide it is, or how uh, or anything we don't we don't know a whole lot about it except that it's going to, going to be if a is positive then it's going to be um, facing upward concave up okay and if the um, if a is negative then the function is concave down so the oops the function function is concave down when a is less than zero. Okay, so we could just draw a generic parabola, maybe like that. My parabola isn't very good, but either way, it's just it's going to be concave down, which means it's a downward facing parabola. Okay. So, all right, we got one more problem, and this one is very is pretty much like the exit ticket. So. Let's take a look at this one. We're going to put everything together that we've learned in the last couple of sections. Um, what I want you to do is take this function and we're going to evaluate the x and y intercepts. We're going to find all the critical points. We're going to determine the intervals on which the function is increasing and decreasing. We're going to classify the critical points as local maxima, minima, or neither. And we're going to find all of the intervals in which the, the function is concave up or concave down and determine the inflection points. Okay, and then we're going to use all that to try to sketch a graph of this function. All right, so let's do that. I'm saying your answers have to be exact and you must justify your answers. So um, a lot of times you can, <laughs> there are ways you have, you a lot of you have graphing calculators, you can graph things without, uh, um, you know, and, and w you know, without having to do the calculus, but the point of these, these problems is to do the calculus. So I want to see your work on these problems. All right. So the first thing is just to find the X and Y intercepts. Okay. So, so remember that the Y intercept occurs when X equals zero. Okay. So what we want to find the Y intercept, we're just going to find F of zero. And if I put zero into this equation, I get zero times E to the zero, which is just zero. So the y-intercept is zero comma zero, which is also an x-intercept. Okay, so if I come down here, I don't know if I guess I can't get it all on there. I'll have to scroll back and forth. Um, so the x-intercept, I've got some blanks down here to fill in. Uh, the x-intercept is zero comma zero, and the y-intercept is zero comma zero. Now there could be other x-intercepts, um, and so the x-intercepts occur when y is equal to zero. So um, I, I can also look at when y is zero and try to find what the x values are when y is zero. That gives me the x-intercepts. Now if I look at that, if I look at this, this, this factor right here, e to the minus x, can never be, um, can never be negative or can never be zero or negative, right? Because e is a positive number, 2.71, whatever. So this can never, never be zero. Okay, zero. <laughs> okay, so I can ignore that. So the only factor that can be zero would be this x value. So that's just telling me, and I've already got that point zero, 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 because I found out that was a y-intercept. Right, so it's also the x-intercept, and that's the only x-intercept. Okay, so my x-intercept, um, the only uh, x x-intercept is zero zero. Okay, 
and that so and and that's it that's all there can be um so we know that you know once it's above the uh, x-axis or below the x-axis it's never going to cross it so that's that's helpful information all right so the next thing we're going to look at is uh, the critical points and to find the critical points i'm going to take the derivative of this function so let's do that let's find the derivative of f of x now i've got two things multiplied by each other i've got x times e to the minus x okay so i need to use the product rule so i'm going to take the derivative of the first which is just one all right one times the second which is e to the minus x plus the first times the derivative of the second okay the derivative of the second is going to be e to the minus x and then we use the chain rule the derivative of uh, minus x is minus one okay so uh, let's clean this up a little bit um so i have i have two terms added together they both have a factor of e to the minus x so i'm going to actually factor that out because i know i have to set this equal to zero to find the the um, inflection points so it's probably a good idea to factor it okay so i'm going to factor the e to the x out and what i have left is one and this becomes minus because i'm taking this it's got this minus one here so minus x okay all right and to find the critical points i'm going to set it equal to zero all right so what does that mean again e to the minus x can never be zero so the only place um, where the first derivative could be zero is at um, x equal one so we have a critical point critical point at x equals one okay now we can't assume anything about that whether it's a minimum or a maximum we have to test to find out whether it's a local min a local max or or neither okay and the way we're going to do that is to test some points on either side of one so i'm going to test at um, zero which is to the left of one so if i plug that into the first derivative right because i'm trying to find out whether it's going from increasing to decreasing or decreasing to increasing or neither because that's going to tell me whether i have a local um, max or min all right so i'm just going to plug values into the first derivative so i'm going to e to the zero times one minus zero e to the zero is one and then one minus zero is one so one times one is one which is greater than zero so it's an increasing function it's an increasing function um, to the left of one and I'm going to now test a point to the right of one. So let's just put in two. So I have e squared times one minus two. So I'm going to get minus e squared, which is less than zero. So it's decreasing. Decreasing. I'll just abbreviate that. Okay, so I do indeed have a change from increasing to decreasing, right? So, um, so if I draw the little number line over here, I'm just going to do it over here. Sometimes it's helpful to have the little number line. So I have a critical point at one and actually it might be helpful to see one is right here on my graph, right? So, so I'll just try to make it line up. There's one. I have, it's going from increasing to decreasing. Okay. All right. So that tells us we have a local maximum. So we have a local max at x equals one all right so let's fill out the information down here so the critical point is x equals one now g of x is increasing and i'm going to use interval notation here and um it's increasing from minus infinity to one okay I've got curved brackets because it doesn't, you know, at, at one, it's neither increasing nor decreasing. It's zero, right? So um, it's increasing on this interval from negative infinity to one. And then it's decreasing from one to infinity. Okay. All right. So that's what we can figure out from the critical points. Um, now, oh, we have also found the local maximum at x equal one. 
And you don't have to find the y value, although when we graph this, it probably would be nice to have the y value of that. Um, so we, we could actually say, if we just if we figure out what f of 1 is, we go back to the original function, which was x e to the minus x, right? <laughs> Scroll up to find it. So then I have 1 e to the minus 1, which is just 1 over e. So um, I could I could say that the maximum is um, I could say the max is at um, and the local max is at um, the point one comma one over e if I wanted to and that'll help because one over e is actually about three point oops not three point seven uh, zero point three seven. So that'll help us get, have some sort of sense of scale, 0 0.37. Okay, because we, we, we do in the end want to graph it. So I'll just hold that for later. And um, okay, so now we just have to take the second derivative because we want to also find out information about the concavity of this, um, of this function. All right, so let's do the second derivative. We have the first derivative here. So the second derivative, I'll just figure out from the first derivative. So um, I'm actually going to use this form here. I'm going to rewrite this though. e to the minus x minus x e to the minus x if I clean it up a little bit. It's easier to take the derivative of this. Well, I don't know if I'd, I've I got to use the product rule either, either way, but I'll just use the, the, the function, the first derivative in this form. So the derivative of e to the minus x is minus 1 e to the minus x. And then we've already, we already found the derivative of x e to the minus x. So I'm just going to actually say minus. And then we found that that derivative is e to the minus x minus x e to the minus x. All right. Now let's clean it up. And I can take away these parentheses if I, if I, um, bring that inside there. So then I have minus 2 e to the minus x plus x e to the minus x. And I can do the same thing because I want to set it equal to 0, so it'd be nice to have it factored. I can factor out this e to the minus x, and I'm left with negative 2 plus x. Okay, and then to find the candidates for inflection points, I'm just going to set that equal to 0. And again, this first uh, factor can never be 0. e to the minus x can never be 0. So um, we have a possible inflection point, possible inflection point, point at x equals 2. Okay, but we have to test it to make sure that it's actually an inflection point. So we're going to test the second derivative on either side of 2. All right, so let's, to the left of 2, a nice number would probably be 1 or 0. Um, I'm just going to do 1. So I'll end up with um, e to the minus 1. So I'm using this, this form of the equation right uh, here. <laughs> OK, so. Um, uh, so I'm plugging in my uh, 1, so I have minus 2 plus 1. Okay, so I end up with um, minus e to the minus 1, okay, which is negative. So it's concave down at that point. And then I can look at what the second derivative is at, on the other side of 2, so I'm just going to choose 3. So I get e to the minus 3, minus 2 plus 3. So now this is a positive one, so I get um, e to the minus 3. Now e to the minus 3 is just 1 over e cubed. But so this is greater than 0. So concave up. OK, so we indeed have a change in concavity. So we can say we have an inflection, inflection at x equal 2. Okay. Um, now we can also record that 
that uh, concavity on this number line too. So I so I'm gonna actually mark two right here, and I know that to the uh, anything less to the right of one is decreasing. So I can just copy that decreasing over there, and then um, it's so between negative or well negative infinity and one it's increasing and concave down right so we have a curve that looks something like that and then between two and one it's decreasing and concave down okay and then to the right of two it becomes concave up but it's decreasing right so it's going to end up being look, looking like that the curve will look like that all right, so let's come down here to our graph and well, let's finish up. We don't have a lo local minima at all, so I'm just gonna say none because we only had one critical point. Um, the function is concave up to the left of two, so minus infinity comma two using interval notation, and it's concave down to the right of two, so two to infinity. And we found we have an inflection point at x equals 2. All right, so let's see if we can graph this thing. We know, first of all, we have a x, the x and y intercepts are right here at 0, 0. And that's the only time it crosses um, the x or the y axis. We have a critical point at 1. And we found that the value is about 0.37. 1 over e is the is the exact value. But the 0.37 gives us a better <laughs> a better sense of where it is. So that's about around here. So that's the point um 1 comma 1 over e. Okay? If I want to mark that point. And that's our that's our local maximum. Local max maximum. Okay? And then we have an inflection point at 2. Now, we didn't evaluate the function at 2. So let's do that. Let's do f of 2 just so we can plot it a little easier. So f of 2. Now, we have to go back to the original function, which is x e to the minus x, right? So if we put in 2, we get 2 e to the minus 2, which is essentially 2 over e squared. And if I put that in my calculator, it's approximately equal to 0 0.27. Just gives us a better idea where to put it on the graph. So at 2, so this is about 0.25, so it's just about there. That's where our inflection point is. So we have an inflection point at um, 2 comma um, 2 over e squared. Okay. So let's draw what this looks like. We have um, increasing and concave down. So I'm going to draw something that's increasing and concave down till we get to the maximum. And then it's increasing, or sorry, it's decreasing and concave down until we get to the inflection point. So let's see. <laughs> I'm pretty good at drawing on this pad. <laughs> um, you get the idea, right? This is really messy. Let me try that again. <laughs> All right, so let's see here. Oh, shoot. I had my eraser on. Okay, let me mark this back here. All right, let's try this again. It's uh, increasing concave down, decreasing concave down. Whoops. Okay, until we get to there. And then it becomes concave up. So we have something that sort of starts going like that from there on out. Okay, so that's generally what the function, the shape of the function looks like. Oops. I'm not making it, I'm not making it better here. <laughs> making it more scribbly, but you get the idea. Looks something like that. All right. So I'm going to, I like I said, I don't have any uh, practice problems in this set because um, the exit problem is one of these problems, and, it, and there's quite a few steps involved. So, um, so I will let you work on the exit problem, and we will see you after Easter break. Um, have a happy Easter. Bye.